My name is Betsy McKinney, and I'm the founder and CEO of It's Time Network. Thank you for joining us today for our Calling All Women and Allies virtual convening. We have women and allies on the call from 13 states today, including a couple from Hawaii, and we are so glad to have all of you with us. Thank you to everyone on the call who was at It's Time 2017 Denver Gender Equity Summit last week, and what an inspiring day it was. We also have Kim Desmond, Director of the Denver Office on Women and Families on the call, and Jessica Stevo from the Denver Women's Commission, who are leading this call today uh, with me as well. So I wanted to give a special thanks to Kim and Jessica, because the success of the summit was really a result of a great partnership between our three offices, and it was such a pleasure to work together this past year in preparation. So today, we will begin with sharing information with you about the summit, but the second part will be all about dialogue and your participation. We, um, we will be sharing with you about the outcomes from the summit, and we will provide you more information about how to get further involved with its time network and the work at hand. We'd like to begin with a quick polling question. So as you'll see that as it pops up in your screen, how many of you on the call were on the summit last week? And if you are on your computer, please respond to the poll question that just popped up and we'll give you the results in a little while. Um, and so Kate, um, I think we're ready to start. We'll be sharing the summit uh, information uh, that took place on Wednesday, May 31st in Denver. And the goal of the summit was to bring together thought leaders, decision makers, and engaged individuals to develop solutions that address gender equity in Denver. There were nearly 400 people in the room last Wednesday, including six to 11 mayors and city managers throughout the day from the Denver metro region, from the cities of Thornton, Lone Tree, Golden, Lyons, Aurora, and Boulder, and Durango, just to name a few along with, of course, Denver's own Mayor Michael Hancock. It was really exciting and powerful to have elected leaders working side by side with community members at the summit. And we were also really grateful to have a number of thoughtful, um, a number of thought leaders and experts on our panel discussions throughout the day that helped inform the conversations that then took place at the tables in the room. And together, we all discussed short-term plans and the need for long-term infrastructure to protect and advance the rights of women and girls, starting at the local level. Today, we will share the outcomes of the summit and we'll talk about what's next in the city of Denver. And the results of our poll are in, and it looks like 43% of today's virtual convening participants were at the summit. So nearly half of you on the call were there, and thank you for joining us. And um, given that the goals of the summit were to include as much participation as possible, we formatted it as less of a conference and more of an interactive dialogue. We used a unique conference technology and format in which participants we're able to see common themes and opinions displayed in real time and then vote on a set of actionable priorities on each topic electronically through an iPad. And that produced immediate and transparent results to the entire room in real time, as we said. So now, Kim, if you would, I'd love it if you will share some of the uh, focus areas of the summit and the principles we use to frame the discussion for the day and before we start, uh, what's important to think about sharing all of this information with those of you who are not from the Denver metro region is it will give you a sense of how this can work in your community and why um, the work we do is framed with these principles, but also gives you an idea of how it could have an impact in your community in the future. So Kim, take it over. Yeah, so definitely was an event-filled day. It was a very packed agenda started at 9, ended at close to um, 5.30, actually. So what you see here on your screen is our three focus areas. 
which were formulated as a result of convening a planning committee here in our city. So these areas are actually created collaboratively. So we, throughout the summit, we focused on career advancement opportunities, which is the succession planning for women. We focused on creating an inclusive culture. And then we focused on family-friendly policies. Within each of these focus areas, we had two categories in regards to the polling options. We had what can government um, do to support these areas, and then we had an option, what can organizations do? Because working within city government, you're also a provider of services, but you also are an employer. So we wanted to like bring the um, parallel to both of those activities. So that was what we um, focused on for each session. Our founding, our, our guiding principles for the summit, one was equity, two was inclusion, and three was intersectionality. We wanted to set some um, groundwork for everyone to do some, be on the same page as us as, in terms of level setting. So really wanted to hit away the importance of saying that our work should be very much so intersectional and in meaning that things, our identities intersect by gender, race, identity, national origin, age, income. So really talking about as we approach these focus areas, please look at them through intersectionally, intersectional lens and make sure moving forward that that's kind of the frame that you're looking through your work. The second, um, the first foundation of principle was equity, which is really looking at the tools that you create in order to provide your employees with individualized resources in order for them to attach and uh, um, accomplish the goals. And then the third was around um, so we had equity, intersectionality, then we had inclusion. So inclusion was the, the action, the, the action that you take to make sure people are included. So that's really what type of environments are you, are you completing and contributing for people to feel like they're involved. So those were our three focus areas. The third option you see here on your screen are the tools that we use to approach that work. So in partnership with It's Time Network, most certainly we talked about the mayor's guide towards accelerating gender equality. And so that's like the checklist of things that you can do within your local government. We also released the Denver Women's Commission, Denver Thrives When Women Thrives Toolkit. Those two tools are very much so complementary in that you could look at the It's Time Guide and get some key actionable items and say, as a mayor, I can do A, B, and C. And then you can plug it into the Women's Commission Toolkit to really go into that action planning phase. So we released those, the, our, our, our toolkit in um, partnership, and then it's time that we released their, their guide. Which I'm happy to see that they're going to update that guide, so I'm looking forward to see what comes out of that. So stay, stay tuned for what that's going to look like in terms of that guide for Denver. But, so that was the focus areas that we had at the summit, and then those were the tools that we used to help accentuate the conversations around action. Great. Okay. Thank you, Kim. And so now that you have a sense of what happened at the summit and what was the, you know, the purpose of the convening, and thank you to those who were listening to this recap who were already there and you, and you experienced it, uh, we want to move on to talk about the outcomes. So the first and perhaps the most important outcome of the day, of course, was learning and learning from one another. And people were in the room together who had never met each other. So with so many leaders in the room, um, we also wanted to make sure that we captured the real state of gender inequality in Colorado, and that is inequality. So if we understand how the real state is, then we can begin to understand what, um, what we might be able to do in order to improve it. So some of the key takeaways for each of the focus areas are as follows. We talked about the barriers to career advancement, and everyone agreed that we need to focus on shifting male-oriented social norms in the workplace, as well as focus on the lack of affordable child care available, which, as everyone, I think, knows, is a significant deterrent to the success of women in the workplace. There are already so many stereotypes around competing priorities for mothers. We don't need, as women, the extra burden of making it difficult for working mothers to find affordable childcare. So as a result of these conversations, um, the room came up with a list of government and organizational policies that would be most critical to address women's advancement. And here's what that looks like. We need the government to support quality and affordable childcare, education, housing, transportation, and healthcare. We need protected, flexible, paid leave and sick days. 
We need to create family-friendly work practices and flexible environments, such as lactation rooms, equal parental paid leave time regardless of gender, flexible work schedules, telecommuting, and more. We need to implement transparency regarding hiring practices, pay structure, and pay rates. And we need to create opportunities for women to take advantage of available resources for advancement and professional development, such as training and scholarships. We need accountability to ensure the entire company or business represents the greater population. And we need to develop a policy-making process that is inclusive of multiple voices, the multiple kinds of expertise and lived experiences that employees have. And we need policies that are tailored to specific employee populations, as opposed to just blanket policies. And just a brief you know, example of that was at the table that I was at. Um, we had two members of the deaf community there and there are specific employee populations like the deaf community that would benefit from particular policies that relate to them specifically. So that's an example. Um, so next, um, we did talk about family-friendly work policies. Kim, do you wanna share the outcomes of that conversation now? And you're on mute, Kim, I think. This is my, my favorite part of the, the conversation, and I think it's appropriate that it to follow the policy conversation on this presentation, we're gonna talk about the organizational cultures because we know that policies cannot um, do us justice without the, the, the correlating inclusive cultures. So some of the outcomes that came out of the conversations around family policies was businesses must provide leave for all employees that is paid, that, is, that, that means pay, pay flexible, um, scheduling pay leave options, making sure that your policies are gender neutral, making sure that employees feel protected and that they're able to provide um, care not just for themselves, but also for their relatives and our friends. And so this was really a part of and connected to our, our intersectional principle, making sure that your policies are really through an intersectional lens and not really just getting into the silos of just for women, because we know that the policy to support women in the workplace also support um, men in the workplace. Also talked about opportunities for all women to earn a living wage, which at our lunchtime session, we had a conversation around um, pay equity in the workplace. So we highlighted two employers, the city of Denver, as well as CSU around their work to approach a gender equity audit. We talked about how employers should make sure that they have a culture of flexibility and stability in um, the workplace scheduling for their employees, which is key, especially for our um, women who are working in lower income jobs where your schedule may change week to week, day to day. So really just providing that is really connected to the affordable child care piece. We talked about other outcomes also included making sure you create supportive team environments modeled by leaderships where employees are concurrent to have work life balance, which is key when you're looking at a, um, a family centric policy, making sure there's a balance there. One of the main pieces, and these are all, as Betsy would say, interdependent or interconnected, um, providing affordable early education options and subsidies for your employees. So when possible, making sure you have some on-site services or subsidies. The city of Boulder talked about what they're doing around providing an option for their employees to bring um, their child to work. So that's definitely a, a policy that was um, highlighted at the summit. So all these policies were discussed and prioritized and voted on at our, at our summit. So Kim, before we go on to the next segment, um, I think it's really important to highlight that in addition to the mayors being at the summit, um, we had a significant number of business leaders in the room, um, men and women leaving their corporate corporations or smaller businesses, we had small business owners, um, and at every table, there was a robust conversation about all of these practices. And what was, I think, heartening was to hear from uh, many of the business leaders that they, in fact, have already been doing some of these policies. And also hearing from the mayors, they have also been enacting some of these policies. And, and the benefits have been uh, so positive that 
I think they were keen to be at the summit and to share their best practices. Can we reflect on that for just a second before we move on? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, a part of our regional outreach strategy was to make sure that we had a balance of multiple sectors. So not only did we include local government, which is your, your mayors, your elected leaders, Colorado is a home state, so we also had managers as well. So we had a manager from as far as Durango, we talked about what he did to um, encourage um, more upward mobility for female executives. We also had um, businesses such as Chipotle, DeVita, um, CH2M. We had a, a large cross section so that way we can have a progressive conversation around inclusion of cross sectors because collaboratively we all work together to ensure we also had individuals, not just who were on a panel, but in our audience, we had a large representation from our local chambers here. I will be remiss if I didn't shout out the, um, the Black Chamber. Lee, I see that you're on the call. So most certainly we had the, the African American Chamber, we had the Women's Chamber, we had um, Denver Metro Chamber supported with a video by Kelly Bruff. So we definitely had a large level of participation across um, the business sector as well as the local government sector. Great. So. One thing I do want to mention as we're reflecting, um, we had a, um, we need to have this conversation within the context of who can be there during the day, which is definitely the policy conversation. We know that a lot of our women who, they don't have the opportunity to attend a summit like this. It is a privilege to be able to get off of work for eight hours in a day. So we definitely talked about that um, to say that it's a privilege to be able to attend and to lend your voice in these summits during the day and so that's why we're needing more workplace flexibility and policies that really help provide that options for our um, low-wage workers or other workers who cannot take off that day so i'll be remiss if i didn't say that that's that um that demographic was missing in the room based on obvious structural inequities around the flexibility component great and just in addition to that you know let's make a pin uh, right now to talk about that later in the Q&A section at the end of the call. Um, as we go forward, the opportunity to use the technology that we used on at the summit uh, last week, we do have the ability to engage people from their home environments or in other places where they can help to contribute. So there are tools and technology now as we build our convening capacity in each city to do just as you said, make it even a flexible experience for people to participate from wherever they are. So we'll talk more about that later. And I also just wanted to add that um, we had uh, a gentleman from the fire department, and I'm not sure which city it was, you might know, Kim, but- um, He was actually from Denver, and he actually is on our Latino commission. His last name is Desmond, which is yes. why. Oh, okay, and so he was there throughout the entire day, and I know that he, um, he, he had some remarkable um, experiences during the summit, and I know that the combination not only of academics, um, you know, paid professionals in our city workforce and, you know, corporate business owners, normal everyday people that are just part of the Denver community, and the mayors made this incredible mix of people, and Kim, you and Jessica and everyone at the Denver Women's Commission did an incredible job bringing together a very diverse group uh, for this set of conversations. So I just wanted to thank you. And, and also note that it's an essential component of um, any of our convenings going forward is making sure that as many and as most people are at the table and represented for the very various communities um, wherever they live. So anyway, thank you for that. And um, and finally, at the day of the summit, we talked about practices that most undermine an inclusive and welcoming workplace environment for women. And that includes practices that actually enable sexual harassment. And policies created for women without women at the table to help create those policies. And I think we see that at the national level as well. Um, and it also includes gender specific workplace clicks. And we're all aware, especially as women, of what clicks are like, and it continues even into the workplace and they can be gender specific. And also um, not being inclusive outside of the gender binary. As we know in our world today, um, gender is, um, for many people, it's a spectrum and they don't identify either as male or female. 
and that there's a new um, way of being inclusive and that welcomes everyone from all ways of expressing themselves. So together we determined that the most important practices that organizations should adopt to ensure that their cultures are inclusive and welcoming are increasing awareness of and training about a range of issues, right? You know, including, of course, implicit bias and inclusive leadership and have that training for all employees. And also encouraging open conversations and candid feedback about exclusion, discrimination, and privilege. So having that open environment where you welcome employees to tell you the important feedback that managers and um, folks at the top need to know. And then also creating a culture of transparency and accountability, as well as identifying the key issues and values for your organization to address through data generation. So that's a mouthful, but having surveys and focus groups with all employees. So using data uh, in order to identify the key issues that the folks in your community and your um, workplace are feeling. And it's a tool that can help uh, elicit the kind of candid feedback that you might need. So now, you. go ahead, Kim. I'm so sorry, Betsy. Go ahead. I just want to add something real quick around the, the inclusive piece, mm -hmm. especially as you're looking at um, being inclusive of all race and ethnicities, which is why that, that foundational um, principle of inclusion is really important. So when you're looking at implicit explicit biases, make sure you're being conscientious of how your environment is also impacted people of color. Oftentimes we miss that in the gender conversation. So make sure we're in, in when you're slicing that and making sure you're digging deeper to say gender, race, ethnicity, age, national origin, etc. Yes, and as a reminder, you know, for me, having the two women from the deaf community, you know, also recognizing that people have different abilities, you know, um, there are different needs. And so being inclusive of everyone's different and differences and recognizing that it's that diversity that makes us stronger and learning how to be with one another through our differences. So, well, um, so Kim and Jessica, um, it's time to take all of these critical learnings and decide what needs to happen next, right, to advance gender equity in Denver. And Kim, I just would like to say that a year ago, I think we were looking forward to this day the most. You're know, like, all right, so what next? What are the outcomes? So if you both will share some of the next steps from your perspective and what you all are gonna be doing within the city of Denver to take this work forward. Uh, thank you, Betsy. I wanted to um, just thank It's Time Network and everybody who participated last Wednesday. It was definitely a remarkable and historical event. Um, and to speak to the next steps, uh, the Denver Women's Commission will be delving into the reports um, that you provide, both, um, you know, just the report and, and the behind the scenes data to really start to um, identify the different suggestions or trends um, that we may be aware of or may not. Um, one of the things the Women's Commission is very mindful of doing and has, um, I feel, successfully done in the last um, number of years is every time we go out to the community, we try to drive the conversation around issues that generally speaking, a lot of us are aware of, but to, to drive that conversation farther, um, to identify very specific issues or very specific um, um, tactics or ideas that can be implemented so that we actually can recommend tangible change. So um, to that, it's not about just pay equity and the 78 cents on the dollar, but how do we really affect that? And, and what are the things that we can do um, in order to uh, affect that change, be it within the city and county of Denver um, and recommendations to the mayor's office and to affect the employees of city of Denver or to the community and business leaders and the many chambers as Kim, Kim mentioned that were in attendance. Um, so at, at least once a year, um, but oftentimes throughout the year, we make recommendations to the mayor's office and there certainly will be one um, forthcoming as a result of all this information. And, and instead of um, sometimes in the past where it's, we're asking for um, 
uh, maybe support into looking into an issue or or a policy or a, gr a stakeholder group to address an issue I am very confident that we'll have very specific recommendations um, similar maybe to the pay equity ordinance that was discussed um, around what New Mexico State and uh, the city of Albuquerque have done that would affect um, both the business community and their their subsequent employees and so uh, many of the 1.7 million people that would have been affected by the mayors um, and then just to continue supporting recommendation changes um, to the benefits and the policies for the city and county of Denver employees because they are the largest employer in Denver so it does affect a lot of people um, but more importantly uh, one of the gentlemen at my table that morning asked me so what does success look like today like what what is success at the end of the day and i said if every single person here and more importantly if every single mayor here goes back and affects one policy change just one be it a lactation room or something um, even more substantial that affects both all, all the employees uh, in their organization that they would they would make a change that would be 1.7 million lives that are changed and affected so um, i'm hoping that we also reach back to everybody that was in attendance um, and ask what kind of recommendations have they seen come to fruition um, and then every every year we have a um, um, very strategic plan that we put in place that has specific tactics that help the Women's Commission achieve the goals um, and they're, they're a kind of a high-level goal uh, around big change of legislation recommendations policy recommendations community collaboration um, and so to the extent that we can uh, very precisely create tactics that help us achieve those goals over the next year and the Women's Commission can effectively um, support the women and girls in Denver. And then uh, the next thing would be to uh, partner with the mayor, mayor's uh, public relations team and the regional director to create the um, dissemination plan to the Metro Mayor. So one of our fourth goals of the Commission is to increase um, the brand and the awareness that the Women's Commission offers to the larger Denver community in um, being the voice of the mayor's office um, to the community to, to so that they know all the support and services that are available to them and then conversely to bring their voice back to the mayor's office. Um, so working with that as well as, uh, as I mentioned, the Metro Mayor Caucus and um, to anybody, uh, I think the other major thing is to, it's not, simply um, just the recommendations from the um, the event, the summit, it's, it's putting that participant guide, um, the recommendations and information from that guide, and um, uh, equally important is the Denver Thrives and Women Thrives Guide that gives each individual, be it a business owner, manager, or an employee, empowered information so that they can affect change at whatever level they're at and putting those documents in the hands of all of these um, people so that whether they were in attendance or not hopefully they've heard of it and then can be um, educated and empowered to make some decisions great thank you Kim do you have some things you want to share yeah and thank you Jessica for so concisely outlining the next steps and so other steps that we will take um, as a as a partnership with the Denver Office of Women and Families and Women's Commission is that we will do some follow-up items with our mayor's PR um, and communications team and our regional director who really helped us create our regional strategy to do some more targeted things and some updates with our Metro Mayor's Caucus. So that will be on our on our list and as well as other key stakeholders. So we'll continue to formulate and um, enhance those relationships and to share all the tools that you heard about at the summit. We also will look at other avenues to explore phase two of the summit. As Jessica stated, it's not just about having the summit, it's really about saying what happens when you leave the summit. So we actually have a workplace environment survey. So we did um, share that at the event. This is not really based on your satisfaction with the summit, but we're really trying to get our, our pulse on what's happening with organi within organizations across our region. So there's questions about 
um, how do you, what is your perception of management transparency around pay, around onboarding, around recruiting, around retention? So we're really going back to our, um, everyone who RSVP'd and attended to say, now tell us about your workplace. And so that way we can understand more and create more spaces to share best practices, but then also to share learning opportunities as well. That's a key part of the summit. It wasn't just about sharing the amazing things that are going well, but it's also sharing the ouch moments, the things that you are trying to enhance or to tweak. So that's part of that survey. So please, if you are part of that 40 plus percent who's on this call, we'll be sending out a link to you. So please make sure you um, fill out that workplace environment survey. Um, Metro actually designed it for us. So we'll be um, partaking in a six to nine month surveying period, looking at um, settings across our city. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, Jessica. Um, so I'll just follow up with It's Time Network. At It's Time Network, we will continue, of course, to collaborate with the city of Denver to support this work ongoing. We will also update the mayor's guide, Accelerating Gender Equality, to reflect the learnings from the summit. And for those of you who are new to this call, the Mayor's Guide was produced in 2016 by It's Time Network. It was as a result of a Mayor's Roundtable event that we produced in San Francisco, which is the first a city in our network city program. And I'll talk to you more about that in a moment. But it is, the Mayor's Guide is the first comprehensive guide for accelerating gender equality at the local level. And it includes 11 different issue areas of importance to women and girls. For the summit, Kim and her team and the Denver Women's Commission uh, chose you know, a particular focus from the guide that focused on workplace um, policies and you know, as a core component of economic security. But there are many other issues in the mayor's guide. So if you don't know it, you might want to go to itstimenetwork.org and have a look. Uh, it shares a lot of best practices and resources. So, um, and as I said, it provides mayors with a toolkit of those readily accessible resources, some model programs and checklists um, for supporting the advancement of women and girls in their community. So we will be updating that mayor's guide with Denver-specific information about each of the 11 issue areas outlined in the guide, not just what came from this summit. So we encourage your contributions to that updating of the guide. If you're interested in doing so, please contact Patricia at itstimenetwork.org and, um, and you can be a part of sharing best practices around those 11 different issue areas you'll see in the guide. So as we mentioned earlier, the Denver Gender Equity Summit was also the official launch of our second pilot city in our network city program. So we now have a new network city chapter in Denver. We're thrilled because the goal of our network city program is to facilitate collective action at the local level. Through this program, we established local advisory councils or LACs made up of diverse women leaders from all sectors in each city. The LAC starts by assessing the status of women and girls in their area and then creates collective impact projects with member organizations to address the most pressing needs. At the same time, um, the local advisory council will be supported by its time network to grow the network itself by inviting more individuals and organizations into the network in their city so that more and more of us are informed and engaged in the changes uh, taking place in our cities. And as you can imagine, the more individuals and organizations in the network supporting this collective action, the more effective we can be in facilitating that progress. So the goal is to connect everyone, women and organizations, city by city. So if you're on this call right now and you're not part of It's Time Network, I wanna invite you to join at itstimenetwork.org and to tell all of your friends about it and why they should be involved so that we can build our capacity for collective action at the local level. So um, we're looking for leaders to participate in the local advisory council in Denver right now. So please reach out to us 
if you or someone you know is interested in nominating, nominating themselves or someone to serve on that council. We'd also, as I said, invite you to join the chapter and uh, in Denver or wherever you are. If you're not in Denver and you're in Hawaii, wherever, as we reach a threshold number of people in every location, we can launch a network city in your community. So it's essential to help grow the numbers in every location. We invite people to participate for as little as $12 per year or more to support this oh, <coughs> collective impact work. While you catch your breath, I'll go ahead and jump in there. So most certainly I can say the Women's Commission will continue to support this, um, this local chapter. It's important for us to continue to foster an atmosphere of collaboration, as you can see, that was amplified at the summit. So please most certainly um, join and support this network as we continue to build out ways to build and execute a collective impact agenda. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I'm back. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll also be sending uh, follow-up information about how to do that. And as I said, you can go straight to our website to join. So I think we'll just move on because I'm definitely having a coughing fit unexpectedly. So in addition to supporting the Network City Chapter Program, definitely feel free to attend the Women's Commission's monthly meetings. So the Commission will um, we'll definitely send a representative to be a part of the council, but definitely also attend our monthly meetings as we continue to give our May recommendations around things that emerge from the summit. <laughs> Thanks, Kim, for jumping in there. So I think we can go straight to Q&A. Um, and do we have some questions, Kate? And Hi, everybody. Um, we have just two questions today, but we encourage you, if you have something on your mind, uh, now's the time to um, either raise your hand or type something in the chat box. Um, one of the questions that came up, and uh, we've already had a response to it, but we can share this uh, as a follow-on to today's call as well as a resource. But the question was around, um, do, do any of the folks on the call offer have a resource that they can point to for a sample policy for protected gender-neutral paid family leave that an organization could use to start their discussions about implementing something similar? Great question. Glad to hear that it's on the minds of um, some folks on this call. And Kim uh, sent out a reference that perhaps, Kim, you could also, I don't know if we're, we've got an open line, but we could drop it in the chat box to share, but we'll certainly make sure it's included in the follow-up email. Yeah, perfect. I sent the link to Veronica. Thank you for asking that question. The city of Denver recently amended our Denver building code. And so essentially what that's going to um, provide, and that's actually, it came from our, the agency that I work for, the LGBTQ Commission. So basically the modification in code um, provides that all existing in new single stall restaurants with any toilet facility that contains a single toilet in seat, that that be designated towards and for a gender neutral bathroom instead of men and women's bathroom. So essentially these are the bathrooms that you see when you go into bigger locations where you, you have like that one stall. So now our amendment to our, our um, building code basically outlines that that will now be a gender neutral bathroom. So that link is in the, the text box. So rest assured that that's something that our city is doing in order to make sure that we are inclusive um, for all of our individuals who are living in our city. Thank you, Kim. Um, so uh, just as a reminder, I think folks uh, had a question about the, uh, the analysis of the summit's findings, and those were sent in a follow-up email, and they're also, they can also be found on our website, but we'll make sure to include them in today's follow-up email to this call as well, uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at, uh, at those results yet. Um, and then finally, um, Okay, so then the person who asked that same question clarified and is looking for, I believe, the pay equity analysis, Ken. Yeah. Um, and I don't know um, if we've distributed that yet, but we'll make sure it looks like you responded to that already in um, yes. the chat. So real quick, so as you, at the summit, at our lunchtime networking session, we highlighted the city and county of Denver as well as CSU, both large-scale organization, completed a gender equity audit. The City of Denver's audit was actually done at the request of the Women's Commission. 
we submitted a huge proposal in order to outline how and why our city should approach a gender equity audit. So that is done, that is complete. So that was talked about at our networking time. If you're interested in learning more about the particulars, which include the executive summary, and we had, it was a 382 classifications, which includes um, a composition analysis by gender, um, male, female. And so if you wanna see the executive summary, most certainly the link is available. I just dropped it into the box. If you want the official larger report, you will have to request that from the Office of Human Resources because we're not, we didn't post the, the huge report on our, on our city link. But just know that the summary kind of gives you that 1,000 foot view and it's very easy to ascertain information. Okay, so I don't have any more questions in the text box, but does anybody have questions they want to pose live or um, any final questions in the text box that you want to post? So Carrie, what I'm seeing is um, a great question that says, how will It's Time Network um, in Denver work with existing Denver networks, such as the Women's Collaborative for Colorado? And um, it's, I wanted to give an update that the morning following the summit, we had a breakfast for a number of women leaders uh, to talk about what's next. And uh, Carolyn, to answer your question, It's Time Network is really providing a framework. And um, that framework allows and provides for that local women leaders decide about who will be part of the local advisory council. It's Time Network doesn't decide. So um, we work with existing Denver networks by just providing um, really a template for how to um, form the chapter and what are the activities that the chapter does in years one and two and that and three and four and that template is strong enough to create consistency across the country as each city comes online so that we're consistently all working toward the same objectives but it has enormous flexibility so that everything that takes place in a network city chapter is a reflection of the people and the organizations that already exist there you all know your community best. No one drops in to try to tell you or uh, that chapter what to do. Um, and so it's really a, it's a tremendously, I think, synergistic partnership and just between structure and then the local um, organizations filling in the content and the details of what takes place. Does that, I hope that makes sense. Carrie, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Uh, no, but there's a similar question, um, a couple of questions below that came in regarding, you know, the fact that there are many collaboratives and networks involved, involving women's organizations and on the ground in Denver. How do, what's the vision for how these come together to work on gender equity and um, support legislation? Well, while we were doing this call, so many thoughts came to mind because while we had this summit on Wednesday, it is the first time, and Kim chime in here with me, but that a summit like this has been done since 1985 in Denver. And one of the needs is for us to convene more regularly and, um, and in a structure that is uh, based on measuring goals and outcomes and tracking measurable goals and outcomes. So um, the way that organizations come together to work on gender equity policies is through these convenings, through contributing to the toolkits that are out there, be it the Mayor's Guide, or the Women Thrive, Denver Thrive, and getting involved that way, or, um, or just simply being part of the network so that you know when specific legislation is up you know, for being passed, and you can participate in action alerts, you can participate in helping spread the news to people in your community. Our elected leaders need to hear from us that these issues matter. And we've never had a um, infrastructure that allows us as women to share our collective voice of support. That doesn't mean that all women are unified on the same issues at all. It is about providing information so that women can voice their support or their concerns when the issues that are of importance to them come up. And I'll give you an example, like here in California, um, our pilot city in San Francisco uh, is interested in helping spread the word about the stronger California legislation. So 
what we have found is that that legislative package that's going up and will affect women across the entire state of California, very few women, even women deep involved in the women's sector here in San Francisco know nothing about the California, Stronger California legislation. So our purpose at It's Time Network is to, as we build the network and more and more organizations and individuals involved here in San Francisco, they help alert all women across California when that package is coming up. We want to reach out to our legislators and let them know what we think about it. And as women, we need to be informed on what that package is so that when it passes, women can um, you know, use the policies that get enacted. So it's all about communication across the network to build our capacity for collective action. And I think what you, what you see here in, in Carolyn, what you see in our city, even with the summit is with Women's Collaborative Colorado, we are all working on these issues. So I, I think that this actually gives us opportunity just to meet more regularly, combine together to do certain things. So most certainly I would hope, you know, I know with Christy Doherty leads up the collaborative and she was actually responsible for introducing me to its time network. And so that's a prime example of our city's organizations working together to convene and collaborate. So I think the Network City program will give us that opportunity. I, I think also um, just participate. That that's definitely the way that yes. we can get you all involved in these endeavors. And Kim, I just want to add that you know Denver. One of the reasons why we love working with Denver as our second Network City is that first of all, Mayor Hancock is just an incredible leader on the issues of importance to women and girls. The fact that he supported this summit so robustly and really put all of his energy and effort behind it through you, Kim, and your work and with the Denver Women's Commission. Um, you know, Denver has a robust infrastructure, a great mayor leader. You have a Denver Women's Commission. The mayor has an office of women and families, which you head. He funds, you know, different programs. He listens. But not all cities have that. And actually, um, it's critical that we establish a structure for women and girls that is outside of the governmental organizations so that no one can decommission them <laughs> or decommission us. And um, we've seen in uh, even most recently in Connecticut and New Haven that the uh, Women's Commission there has been essentially mm, decommissioned and depowered by being put into another office, uh, underfunded, and it's near to um, not it's not as powerful as it was. And so the need for us to build these infrastructures to support women's organizations working collaboratively is ever more important as we are never certain who will be in office and what their disposition will be about women and women's rights. So it needs to be independent. So I think we're close to the end of the call, unless we have any other questions. Or yeah, we have a couple more questions that came up. And also, um, we just want to remind folks about the challenge opportunity, Betsy, but let's get to these questions first. Okay. Um, so um, what, a question came in about what kinds of contributions we're looking for for the mayor's guide. Great. What we're looking for is um, any types of specific recommendations or resources that you might have regarding any of the 11 different issue areas. And I don't have all of those off the top of my head, but they are issue areas such as women's economic security, workplace policies, um, girls and STEM education, housing and homelessness, women's health and reproductive rights, LGBTQ um, rights, um, women and the environment, um, just to name a few, um, human and sex trafficking. So if your field, if you are aware of policies or resources or specific recommendations that would be good um, that you know of in the Denver metro region where things are working, um, provide us any resources that are Denver metro specific and that would be great. So have a look at the Mayor's Guide online at It's Time Network and let us know if you have some suggestions. What else, Carrie? And, and I think then the last question is, um, I'm part of an organization that's relevant to this work. How can my organization get involved in the local chapter? 
Great. Well, we would love for you to go online to It's Time Network and join the network. Um, so you can start there and also um, send us an email to, uh, for right now, um, we'll send them to patricia at itstimenetwork.org. And, um, and we will reach out to you and let you know how to be involved as we begin to form the local advisory council and get going in Denver. But don't let, don't let that deter your involvement. The Women's Commission is around. We most certainly have a, a, a firm relationship with It's Time Network. So feel free to attend our monthly meetings as well. As I, as I stated before, we'll definitely continue to have a nexus and collaborative relationship with It's Time Network. So make sure you're also attending the commission meetings, which are the first Thursday of every month. And then there you will learn more about our Denver Thrive and Women Thrives Guide. But then you'll also be able to get involved in some of our committees and things of that nature. So our next meeting is July the 13th because July the fourth weekend is a holiday. So definitely feel free to join us as well. Great. And so, so what we're excited to share is that we just launched a matching campaign from a generous donor in Denver who will match donations from the next 100 people to join the network in Denver. So please join using the link in the chat box and spread the word to other women and allies who might be interested in as well. As we said, a minimum um, contribution to join is $1 a month, which is $12 a year. We ask that be done all at once at $12. It's, a, it's at a, a price that everyone can afford and that allows us to share it with everyone and to tell everyone, yes, we as women need to come together in all of our cities and participate in a network where we can share best practices and most importantly that we track measurable goals and outcomes. I have been in this work for a few decades and watching the women's um, movement and we are missing essential infrastructure that would make us more successful and um, it's critical that we build this national network that joins us together so that we can become more powerful in each of our communities in making sure that the progress for women and girls continues, that it doesn't slip backward, and we need to track that measurable um, progress and to ensure that we know and that every woman in our community knows what is happening for women and girls. And so, Join the network, and um, and we look forward to all of our next steps together. Is there anything else, Kim or Jessica, that you'd like to share before we wrap up? I would say don't let the twelve dollars deter you. That's like, right. If if that's something that you cannot afford, because we do got to be um, recognize that twelve dollars could be a lot for some individuals. So make sure that if you can't um, pay that annually. Just reach out to to Betsy. My experience with the network is that they're they're very kind and they're very flexible with making sure that everyone can attend and not having your financials be a restriction. Yes, yes, yeah, that's right. And to, exactly, Kim, twelve dollars is not affordable for everyone. For some people, it's a hardship. So, absolutely. And if you would like to become part of the network, um, don't let. Uh, you know, finance is being an issue. Everyone is welcome. And we also have generous uh, donors who uh, pay it forward in order to cover the costs of folks who uh, are not able to contribute anything except energy and effort, which is everything. That is everything. And so um, um, I think if Jessica, unless you have something else to share, uh, anything from you before we say goodbye? No, just to thank everybody for participating today and for those that are on the call that participated last week. We, again, recognize what a time commitment um, this is away from all of our normal daily uh, jobs and duties and to the extent that um, that shows your commitment to changing your respective world or uh, where you are and or Denver's women and girls, we wholeheartedly appreciate that. So thank you. Absolutely. So thanks to everyone on the call. Have a great day and we'll be in touch as, uh, as we go forward and uh, have a wonderful day today. Thank you.